together in a short time serving were long needed and will be done. South Korea announces a new platform based on blockchain technology to help exporters by making more data available to them and helping them bypass expensive and time-consuming customs processes. And reports say the preliminary trade deal reached by the, Chi by the U.S. and China was smaller than President Trump wanted, and some even say it was a win for China. It's 4 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thanks for tuning in to Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting. Just 35 days after he was sworn in, South Korean Justice Minister Cho Kuk has announced his resignation. In a statement handed out to reporters a few hours ago, Cho said his role in bringing about prosecutorial reform has ended, and he asked for the public to support the government and his successor in completing the reform. The announcement came just three hours after Cho unveiled a set of reform measures. The former presidential aide for civil affairs said that he felt apologetic to the public regarding the investigations into his family, saying he'll now put everything aside to take care of his wife and children. For the past two months, Cho and his family have been under investigation for what are said to be his family's suspicious investments in a private equity fund and his daughter's college admissions. Now we go to the nation's top office for its response following the Justice Minister's resignation. We have our presidential correspondent Shin Semin on the line for us. Shin Semin, uh, Semin, tell us more. Right, Devin. The president just moments ago said he's sorry for social conflict over issues surrounding Justice Minister Cho Kuk. He added that it's regrettable that the Justice Minister and the Prosecutor General weren't able to work together on reforming the nation's prosecution. This is him moments ago. 오늘 조국 법무부 장관이 발표한 검찰 개혁 방안은 역대 정부에서 오랜 세월 요구되어 왔지만 누구도 해내지 못했던 검찰 개혁의 큰 발걸음을 떼는 일입니다. 검찰이 스스로 개혁의 주체라는 자세를 유지해 나갈 때 검찰 개혁은 보다 실효성이 생길 뿐 아니라 앞으로도 검찰 개혁이 중단 없이 발전해 나갈 것이라는 기대를 가질 수 있게 될 것입니다. With that, the president promised to complete prosecutorial reform despite the resignation of Justice Minister Cho Kuk, and he ordered the Justice Ministry to wrap up the necessary revisions on the reform plan within this month. And mind you, Devin, his raw reaction to the news coming from his weekly meeting with his top aides, which, by the way, had been pushed back an hour from its regular schedule of 2 p.m. every Monday to avoid overlapping with the Justice Minister's announcement this afternoon. Right. Well, the controversy over the justice minister and his family members on a number of issues, including this alleged uh, uh, improper financial practices, has done some damage to the Moon administration. Tell us more about that. Right. The issue of the justice minister and his family members currently being investigated for corruption allegations had been causing trouble for the Boone administration in moving forward with its state affairs. And that caused the Boone administration's approval rating to tank to its lowest level since he took office in May 2017. And according to Real Meter, his rating fell three percentage points on week to 41.4 this week with a margin of error, 2.2 percentage points. And the survey commissioned by local news broadcast YTN and Real Meter did a phone survey of 2,502 people nationwide aged 19 or older over four business days this past week. And just to recap, the now resigned Justice Minister and his family are being investigated over allegations that range from financial malfeasance to pulling strings to get his daughter ad admitted into medical school. And such issues surrounding this family of Justice Minister have divided the nation into half with with rallies calling on the justice minister to quit, while counter-protesters criticized the prosecutors investigating him, as Cho had been tasked by the president to overhaul the nation's prosecutor's office for its extensive powers. Now, Devin, that's all I have for now, but I'll be sure to bring you a more comprehensive report in our evening newscast on the reaction of the presidential office in regards to the justice minister's resignation. Back to you. All right, Semin, we'll be looking forward to that. Thank you. Now, disappointing news for football fans here in Korea because it looks like Tuesday's historic World Cup qualifier between South and North Korea won't be televised. However, the game is on and the South Korean team is going to be in Pyongyang for their first inter-Korean game in the North Korean capital in nearly 30 years. Kan Hyung-woo reports. 
the highly anticipated inter-Korean football match in Pyongyang, the first of its kind in 29 years, is unlikely to be broadcast live. According to South Korea's three major TV networks, KBS, NBC, and SBS on Monday, plans for the live broadcast of Tuesday's World Cup qualifier between the two Koreas fell apart. Although there is a day left until the match, Seoul's unification ministry said North Korea is still remaining silent. Understanding the situation in the North, we are going to do whatever we can with the Korea Football Association to make it work. But right now, the live broadcast of the match does not seem realistic. Given the high interest in the match, the unification ministry is going to set up two monitoring rooms, one at the Korea Hotel where the South Korean players are staying, and the other at the ministry to try to provide real-time updates. But that depends on what kind of communication channel the North will allow. Another way to learn about the match is to check the FIFA or Asian Football Confederation websites, but they provide limited information such as goals and substitutions. Pyongyang also has not answered Seoul's calls to allow civilian spectators. The Taegak Warriors will compete in a hostile environment with tens of thousands of North Korean supporters in the stands at the Kim Il-sung Stadium. Taking a flight from Beijing to enter the North, the South Korean men's national football team are expected to have only one official practice at the Kim Il-sung Stadium on Monday evening. Tuesday's inter-Korea match is set to kick off at 5.30 p.m. Korea time. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. The most powerful typhoon to hit Japan in decades has left more than 30 people dead and 19 unaccounted for. Typhoon Hagibis left a trail of destruction throughout the country and it seems radioactive waste from the Fukushima nuclear plant has gone missing. Our Yi Min-san tells us more. The season's 19th typhoon, Hagibis, slammed into Japan over the weekend, causing dozens of casualties and leaving many regions flooded. Hagibis also swept across Fukushima, home to the nuclear plant that melted down following the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. According to Japanese media, the city of Tamura in Fukushima Prefecture said Sunday that an unknown number of bags containing contaminated waste from the plant were lost. Officials say heavy rains carried the bags to the nearby Furumichi River. That river connects to another river and flows into the Pacific Ocean. The city retrieved 10 bags from the river, but they haven't been able to confirm how many went missing out of the more than 2,600 bags kept in a temporary storage. Each bag weighs between 700 kilograms and 1.3 tons. They contain grass and wood collected from areas that were heavily contaminated by radiation. City officials insist contaminated waste did not leak out of the bags and they will carefully check the storage and management record. However, this isn't the first time something like this has happened. In 2015, contaminated waste from the Fukushima plant went missing in similar circumstances when the region was hit by torrential downpours. Im Min-sun, Arirang News. As South Korea continues to struggle with falling exports, the government is planning to launch a platform based on blockchain to help give exporters a boost. Our Kim Hye-sung has the details. Finance Minister Hong Nam-gi says the government will help support exports by establishing a digital trade support platform called U-Trade Hub by 2021. At the Innovative Growth Strategy meeting on Monday, Minister Hong said the blockchain-based digital platform will integrate various trade-related data such as exports, foreign investment, and overseas projects from government ministries and institutions like the Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency. This information will be available for exporting companies and help them expand into the overseas market. At the same time, the export process of procurement, customs, logistics and payment services will be digitalized through AI and big data. The government says this will help boost e-commerce and cut costs for companies in registering their export data as they won't have to go through licensed customs agents and shipping companies. The finance minister also said that the government will ease 33 regulations that hinder innovation in new industries and new technologies. That includes the easing of regulations in using industrial collaborative robots and a simpler safety review process for chemical production facilities. 
김혜성, 아리랑 뉴스. Uncertainties globally apparently have South Korean manufacturers gloomy about the fourth quarter. According to a survey of 2,000 local firms released Monday by the Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry, business sentiment fell one point from the previous quarter to 72 for the October to December period. A reading below 100 means pessimists outnumber optimists. The chamber says exports have been weak for 10 straight months, while listed companies saw their operating profits decline in the first half of the year by 37 percent. It attributed the weakness mainly to the U.S.-China trade war, Japan's export curbs and fluctuating raw material prices. Last week, the U.S. and China reached what's being called a Phase 1 deal on trade, with Beijing agreeing to buy more American agricultural goods and Washington saying it won't raise its tariffs. Major news outlets, though, say it was a win for China. Our Yoon Jung-min tells us why. With U.S. President Donald Trump scrapping his planned tariff increases on Chinese goods and calling a truce to their trade war, The Wall Street Journal says it was China who emerged victorious from last week's trade talks in Washington. According to the paper, the truth opens an opportunity for China to avoid concessions it doesn't want to make, forcing President Trump's hand with his re-election bid looming. The Wall Street Journal pointed out that China hasn't confirmed yet whether it will buy up to $50 billion of U.S. farm products, as announced by Trump. Bloomberg said the deal is far smaller in scope than what President Trump had expected. It said the Chinese purchases of U.S. farm goods is the biggest win for Trump, but this was first offered by China more than two years ago. It also pointed that commitments on intellectual property and currency were unspecified. Citing an expert, Bloomberg also said the deal hardly resolves the sources of the friction between the two countries. Other major news outlets, including AP, were also rather critical about the trade deal, insisting a lot of issues remain despite the trade truths. The U.S. and China agreed on Friday to the first phase of a trade deal, with China agreeing to buy U.S. agriculture goods worth 40 to 50 billion U.S. dollars, and America agreeing not to raise tariffs on some Chinese goods to 30 percent from the current 25 percent. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. It's time now for an in-depth look at the market news as we start the week. And for that, I'm joined on the line by Dr. Song Soo Young, Professor of Business at Jungang University. Dr. Song, thank you for coming on today. Yeah, good to see you again. Mm. So just minutes before the markets closed last week on Wall Street, President Trump said a deal had been reached with China that will reduce, as we just heard, some planned tariffs in exchange for China buying 40 or 50 billion dollars more in U.S. agricultural goods. What do you see in this? Is it a big deal? Yeah, I think it's a big deal, even though the total amount is uh, relatively small and uh, uh, the China's concession was less than expected. But However, uh, both sides uh, would like to make a deal because both sides have suffered enough from the past uh, escalation of the trade conflict. And uh, consequently, China has been relieved of the potential uh, run out of the uh, capital out of China or the uh, stark uh, appreciation of the China's lemon, uh, lemon V. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Trump administration has been uh, pressured because of the recent uh, employment, new jobs opening uh, in August is less than expected. In the particular, it could have uh, some damage on the Midwest areas in the United States. As a result, both sides would like to make a deal, even though it is uh, uh, tentative. But uh, further, it could signal the further development of the in good uh, the, in phase two in Santiago on uh, this, uh, November 15th in the APEC meeting, and so this turns out to be uh, some turning point of the ask, uh, of the uh, China and the U.S. dispute, which will be. Uh, will work in favor of the world economy. Well, clearly the trade deal, uh, a big factor in the markets. Wall Street was up on Friday. Today there's a rally in Asian markets. What's happening uh -huh. there, and uh, where do you see the markets going in the days to come? Yeah, always the stock market has been uh, respond uh, some, with some excessively respond, so exaggerated. So do, we do not do not see a very uh, positive news out of the stock price uh, increase in the Asian market. But at least this could be a, 
some good indication of the further uh, alleviation of the U.S. and China trade dispute. So which will be a, a very good news to the world economy. So uh, the stock market reaction is uh, reflected the uh, people's anticipation, but we have to wait and see what would be the phase two uh, agreement or truce could be retained and sustained in the future or not. Indeed. Well, uh, this week we have the Bank of Korea meeting to set interest uh -huh. rates. What else is coming up that we should be watching? Oh, uh, definitely. I, I expect the 0.25 uh, percentage point decrease in the basic interest rate because uh, uh, particularly Korea has suffered so much from the China and the U.S. Uh, trade dispute because our economy relies too much on the international trade. And also, recently, the newly elected IMF chair uh, woman, uh, the Kristalina, Kristalina Georgiev, has pointed the three countries specifically on her speech in IMF meeting about Germany, Netherlands, and South Korea, whose fiscal uh, uh, status of the government is too good to uh, not to use the fiscal policy. So uh, she has urged the three countries to spend more money, particularly to boost the economic spending, particularly in Korea, whose uh, percentage rate of the government debt against uh, GDP is less than 50 percent. This is uh, actually uh, Austerity. Uh, I think this is austerity. So, therefore, I would like to urge not only the decrease of the basic interest rate by the uh, Bank of Korea, but also the quite uh, large expansion of fiscal policy is expected. Well, we'll be watching for those measures uh, to come down the pipe soon. All right, Dr. Song, that's where we'll have to leave it today. Thanks so much for coming on. Mm, thank you. Meanwhile, South Korea and China have agreed to resume joint patrols to crack down on illegal fishing. South Korea's fisheries ministry says patrol boats from the two countries will scour the joint fishing zone in the West Sea from Monday through Sunday. Only authorized fishing boats from the two countries are allowed to fish in the zone. Each side will share the results of their patrols with the other. More than 30 illegal Chinese fishing boats have been caught by the two sides since the joint patrol started in 2014. South Korea alone has seized 92 illegal Chinese fishing boats so far this year. South Korea's elderly are more willing to invest their precious time and money on enjoying themselves compared to the past. With the shift in consumption trends, instead of being largely overlooked, the market for products aimed at the elderly is rapidly expanding. Hong Yu reports. In the past, senior citizens had a hard time keeping up with the latest consumption trends, especially in electronic devices such as smartphones. But now, around 80 percent of people in their 60s carry smartphones, especially ones that have been customized to be easier for older people to use. There are many other products that have been designed to target the elderly, who have been called the new silver generation in Korea. One of these is a smartphone which has content tailored to the older generation, such as Tiruti music and word quiz games. Also, it comes with a pre-installed dementia prevention app that helps users check their mental health once in a while. It has a white 6-inch screen and is very user-friendly. I use smartphones to watch videos on YouTube. I watch the news with my phone, and I also use KakaoTalk to chat with people. There are also AI speakers made for elderly citizens living alone, which they can talk to and feel less lonely. The device can detect a user's emotions when they're having a conversation. Even though it's not a human companion, the elderly say it helps them feel less lonely. Even more, they come equipped with games designed to prevent dementia. Users can ask the speaker to start the quiz, where they will have to answer four questions based on memorization. Aging well is a term that could sum up the latest consumption trends among the elderly. They're willing to spend more on healthy foods and other premium goods that are organic and eco-friendly. The new silver generation, people who have the money and time to invest in themselves, consume in order to reward themselves and be happy. This is called self-focused consumption. 
In fact, because of the growing elderly population, the consumer market for senior citizens, excluding financial products, is expected to reach 60.8 billion U.S. dollars in 2020, according to the Korea Health Industry Development Institute. Hong Yu, Arirang News. Just three years from now, everyone here in Seoul will be able to use free public Wi-Fi. The Seoul Metropolitan Government announced last week how it plans to establish a broadband network covering the entire city. Che jong yoon tells us more. Nine out of ten Koreans use smartphones. But at the same time, Koreans pay comparatively a large amount of money to use the Internet on their mobile phones. Recent reports show that one gigabyte of data costs around 15 U.S. dollars in Korea which is the most expensive price tag among countries with high smartphone penetration rate. This costly mobile price has created digital inequality among Koreans, leading to so-called Wi-Fi refugees who move around places to find Wi-Fi. Data is always not enough. I sometimes pay extra for overusing data. So when I'm out, I only use my smartphone where Wi-Fi is provided. Free public Wi-Fi now is concentrated in subways, buses and main streets. To expand the range of public Wi-Fi, Seoul has announced its plan to build a data-free city, establishing more than 4,000 kilometers of municipal broadband networks. Currently, Seoul's network covers 30 percent of the city and is mostly limited to administration business uses. We plan to install more than 16,000 public Wi-Fi application processors around the city by 2022 extending the coverage area to 100 percent. The administration says the 12 million foreigners who visit Seoul every year will also benefit from the plan as everyone can access the free Wi-Fi. Because you can save a lot of money and uh, otherwise you have to pay your provider and it's very expensive if you are out of your country if you use uh, your cell phone. The Kenyan government does not provide free Wi-Fi to tourists so most of the time tourists or even if they are there for short visit, are forced to register SIM card so that they are able to have internet on their phones. This marks a first for any city in the world, building a municipal broadband network that covers its entire metropolitan area. Once complete, citizens and tourists alike will have access to free public Wi-Fi, even in some small back streets like this. Seoul expects this project to save around 40 U.S. dollars per user leading to around $30 billion of total benefits. Choi jung yoon Arirang News. Earlier this year, South Korea became the first country in the world to test a 5G driverless car on city streets. Now they're working to make them even safer. Oh Soo-young reports. Getting your car out of the parking lot can be a daily hassle living in the city. But running on Korea's 5G mobile network, a driverless car can pick you up at your doorstep, saving precious minutes in the morning. Korean telecom firms like LG Plus are developing 5G V2X or vehicle to everything technology, which enables driverless cars to communicate with other vehicles, gadgets, networks and even traffic lights to make your journey as smooth and safe as possible. LG Plus test drove a driverless car on an open road for 15 minutes using new safety solutions. The vehicle managed to detect jaywalking pedestrians and slowed down when an ambulance passed. Using geofencing, it noticed sudden accidents on the road and switched lanes. The many sensors in driverless cars can only detect and collect data about its nearby surroundings. However, using a 5G cloud system, the car can receive and exchange information about other vehicles, road conditions, certain obstacles and other variables ahead in real time very quickly. Our solution optimizes such sensors based on deep learning and cameras to detect diverse situations on the road. LGE Plus was the first in the world to successfully test a 5G vehicle on city streets this past March, working with Hanyang University's ACE Lab. But to stay ahead of the competition, Professor Son myung says South Korea needs to get rid of the red tape that hinders research and development. Currently, Korea has only about 80 driverless cars that have been approved for test driving. 
This compares to the thousands being tested in China and the United States. More cars need to be tested in order to collect data, which is critically needed in order to optimize technology as well as enhance trust in their safety. Also, there should be a central control tower between government bodies, such as the ministries of science, land and industry, as well as the police to efficiently manage and grow the sector. Autonomous cars are also part of the government's $158 billion investment plan to grow the industries of the future by the year 2030. But many experts say without removing regulatory obstacles, Korea could fall behind in developing core sensor technologies. Oh Young Arirang News. And that does it for this newscast. Thank you for watching.